Hey, this is Pastor Ian of Plus Life Church, and we're so excited that you found this resource, and we pray that it blesses you and edifies you in your own walk with God. Listen, we want to remind you that this is a supplement and doesn't replace your own time in God's Word, nor does it replace actual church. So if you're not plugged into a local body of Christ, we invite you to come join us for worship at Plus Life. All the information is in the description box below. Know that you are loved, you are loved, you are loved. God bless. And tell someone the title of my sermon this morning, When Dead Men Rise, or rather, When Dead Men Walk. <laughs> when Dead Men Walk. So we are continuing our Gospel of John series in John chapter 11 for the past few weeks. We have been, been laying the groundwork, the, the context for this great miracle of Lazarus' resurrection. If you recall, at the beginning of John's uh, gospel, or rather John chapter 11, we see, we, we talked about God's timing in that Jesus was informed that Lazarus was ill, and uh, Jesus delays, in fact, he delays two more days until Lazarus actually passes away before he embarks on the journey to go visit Lazarus and the family. And, and he says that this is to demonstrate God's glory, or rather the glory of the Son of God and we saw as after uh, after Christ arrives, he has a conversation with Martha and Martha, who is grieving, who is weeping at the loss of her her, her brother's life, uh, says, "Lord, if you had only been here, he wouldn't have died." But we also see a, a glimmer of hope in her, and Jesus affirms that hope by saying, "Your brother will rise because he is the resurrection and the life." Jesus claims he makes that great "I am" statement that he is the resurrection and the life, and of course, Martha did not fully grasp that, as we'll see in our passage this morning. Uh, but Jesus was declaring that all source of life finds its finds itself in Him. All, uh, the, he, that all life finds its source in. Him and that He is the resurrection, that, that eschatological moment in human history where all the dead will rise and face judgment. He is that resurrection. He is that judging, that judgment to come. And of course, last week we looked at really the humanity of Christ, where Christ is moved to emotion. Where we even read how he, he, he's indignant towards the situation that he finds himself in with these mourners and Mary coming to finally see him and, and Mary who, who is very much doubtful and even almost sounds like she even blames, puts blame, uh, blame on Christ for not being there when her brother was sick. And now we finally get to, to this great miracle and all of that, everything that we've been talking about these past few weeks culminates in this great miracle of Lazarus rising from the dead. Um, we have this, in my household, we have this family tradition of reading this, uh, this sort of Bible stories before bedtime. And we've been going through this uh, particular book. It's called The Kingdom of God. Maybe you've heard of it. I would recommend if you have children or grandchildren that you get this series of books called The Kingdom of God. It's the, basically the Bible. They retell the, the story of, of Scripture but they, in a way that children understand it, but they actually use uh, the, the text from Scripture as well. So it's a very encouraging uh, book series. In any case, we, we were reading this past week about the miracles of Jesus, and the story of, of Lazarus' death was in that, in, in that chapter of that book. And to see the amazement the wonder in my children's faces as we talked about how this dead man came back to life. You should see they're like, what? How is that even possible? Right? And they had this, this, um, this wonder about them at this reality of, of, of this, this dead person coming back to life. And, and rightly so, because this miracle of Christ is written down for that, for that effect. For that emotional reaction. It's not just a bunch of facts. It's, it's meant to shock and amaze readers, as we'll see in the text itself. Remember, John is writing with evangelistic intent. John 20, 31. These are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, the strategy that John, that, that John uses by specifically write, recording these miracles is to, is to have readers look at this text and be like, who is this Jesus? 
How is he able to raise the dead? How is he able to perform these miracles? Have you ever heard or seen anything like this? The appropriate response to this miracle is awe and amazement. To step back and say, wow, my God, who is this Christ? But in reality, I feel like us modern readers maybe have been desensitized to all of that, been numb to all of that. That sense of wonder maybe has escaped us. How many of us here, as we were reading the text just now, and I, you know, I, I tried to put as much drama in, in my reading of it, how many of us, in, as we were reading this text just now, felt like, oh my goodness, did this, how did this happen? Anyone feel that sense of awe or wonder? Nobody? Man, i got to practice reading more. What is this? But I get that. Yes, amazing. One person. Praise God. But I get it because you look at the TV, you look at movies, there's so many zombie movies out there now, people coming back from the dead. You watch a superhero movie, a superhero is always coming back. It's like resurrection is nothing new to us anymore. We see it on TV, in fantasy, in, in all of these genre movies, and a lot of cheap imitations of this great miracle that happens. And I think we've grown numb to what takes place here. And the result is, for, maybe for us adults, <laughs> that, that these miracles of Jesus don't have the same impact, don't have the same wonder or, or amazement as it ought to. And the goal for us this morning is to really unpack this miracle once again and to see it with fresh eyes with the hope that we would be once again captivated and amazed at this great act of God to bring someone from the dead back to life. And, and as, as, as the Holy Spirit, via John, intended this passage to be to, to again, just, just come to a realization of who Jesus is. Who, who he really is, his, his true identity as a son of God. And I think the way that, that, that we can grasp that awe, that, that wonder, is really to understand the significance of Lazarus' death, or rather resurrection. Because... We may not be able to see that physically. We maybe weren't, we're, we're, we're not, we weren't there 2,000 odd years ago to witness this great miracle. But when we understand the motivation behind this, when we understand the reasoning as to why Christ performs this great miracle, the, the heart behind it, the heart that the Savior has, I think that is what will captivate us and, and set our minds to wonder and awe and be amazed once again at at who Christ is and what God has done. The God who makes dead men to walk. So let's unpack our passage here. Uh, let's start at verse 38 and, and let's, let's go verse by verse to see. Just very quickly to see if there's anything here that we've missed. In verse 38, let's go to there. And Jesus deeply moved again. And remember last week we talked a lot about that. He was indignant. He was agitated, and of course he was sorrowful. He wept with, with Mary last week in our passage, and, and he was also angry at the very presence of death in that whole situation. We talked about that. Uh, in verse 33, he was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled. So here again, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Now, this actually gives us insight into the status of Lazarus and his sisters and that family. It was more, most likely that they were a wealthy family. Only rich people back in the day had tombs. This was probably going to be a family tomb uh, that Lazarus was laid in where a stone was rolled in front. If you recall, when Jesus was buried and laid in a tomb, it was in the tomb of a rich man. That's only possible because uh, the, these stone tombs were only possible because of the, the affluence of family. Look at verse 39. It says, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. If you recall, Martha, though, though came to Christ asking, or rather stating, if he had been here, he wouldn't have died, still showed some glimmer of hope in the Savior. If he asked anything of the Father, I know he will do it, but that hope in Christ wasn't one of one for resurrection, because again, even in this statement, we see Martha sort of objecting to opening this tomb, possibly still doubtful that Christ would bring Lazarus back from the dead. And we see that faith, that kind of faith address in verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, 
you would see the glory of God, the glory of God, the glory of the Son of God to raise the dead, the resurrection and the life. So then verse 41, they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, and listen to this, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. You notice that Jesus doesn't ask the Father for anything. He simply thanks God. Simply thanks God for hearing him. And he does so, as he said, for the people around him, for the people around him to know that God hears him. And we'll talk more about this in a minute and the significance of that. But uh, notice he is also affirming his intent for the miracle, that this miracle is to, to display the glory of the Son of God for those who are witnessing it, or for those who are standing around. And of course, for us who are reading it today. In verse 43, It says, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I love the the Baptist uh, interpretation of this, where they say that Jesus had to specifically say, Lazarus, come out, because if he just said, come out, all the dead would rise. I believe it. I absolutely believe that. That's That's an amazing thought. Then I love how John, after that moment, states what happens next. He says it very simply. He, it can't be misconstrued. And it's very, very, very pointed. He says, verse 44, the man who had died came out. It's amazing. Right? He, he knows, we're, we know he's talking about Lazarus, but he says it in a way as if he, as, even as he's penning this, this down, he himself is shocked. He himself is still in wonder and amazement at this idea that this man who had died came out of this tomb. He's still in a state of shock. And then it says, of course, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Of course, the the Jewish burial rites required that dead bodies were to be loosely wrapped in linen and in those linen, they would put spices to, to, to get rid of some of the odor as, as, the, as the body deteriorates. They didn't practice embalming, right? That's the practice of uh, preserving the, the, the body or, or slowing down the, the process of deterioration. Uh, the Jewish people just wrapped the bodies in linen and put spices in them. So that's the text. And we see the nuances there. We see John's excitement to tell this story, to to just simply state that the man who had died came out. And that's great and all. I think we grasp that. And now we can look at some of the significance of Lazarus' resurrection. Again, the nuances behind there, why specifically John records this, and even the the allusions to our own salvation as a result of this great uh, this great miracle. Let's look at the, 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 first, the first thing that, the, the first significance of this resurrection. First and foremost, it authenticates Christ's divinity. It authenticates Christ's divinity. Of course, throughout the Gospel of John, John lists a whole list of miracles that Jesus performs, uh, authenticating, giving evidence to his, his divinity, his godhood. And John specifically records seven miracles throughout his Gospel. If you recall in John chapter 2, the water being turned into wine, right? And and, and that demonstrates the power of Christ over creation, turning matter into a different substance of matter. And uh, we also see in John chapter 4, the healing of the nobleman's son. If you recall that story, Jesus doesn't even have to be in the presence of the sick son. He just simply, at his word, commands his son to be healed and The son was healed. That, again, demonstrates the power of his word. In John chapter 5, we see the healing of the lame man in the pool of Bethsaida. That is Christ's power over infirmities, over sickness. In John chapter 6, verse 1 to 14, we see the feeding of the 5,000, right? Jesus performs his great miracle to show people the power, his power to provide in the same chapter, John chapter 6, the walking on water, his power over nature and chaos and the storm. In John chapter 9, he gives sight to a, a, a man born blind. That is the power of creation. The God, or rather Christ, gives this man who was born blind sight, a man who never had sight to begin with. He's creating completely new eyes 
in that context. And now, in this chapter, John 11, we see the resurrection of Lazarus, demonstrating the power that Christ had over death. Now, we know throughout the rest of the gospel, the other gospels, that this is not the only resurrection that Jesus performs. In Luke chapter 7, we see Christ bring back from the dead the widow's son. And also in, in Luke chapter 8, Jairus' daughter. But despite those, those miracles also being miracles of resurrection, those, those miracles were very much close to the time of, the, uh, of decease or the time of death. And some would even argue that those, those resurrections we may not actually have been resurrections, right? Those opponents of Christ and his disciples could have said, well, maybe they were just sleeping or maybe they were just really in a coma or they were sick and, and Jesus just woke them up. Now, in comparison to Lazarus' death, Lazarus was dead for four days. You know what that does to the human body? If you don't, that's fine. I did the research. Uh, I, I looked into what this means for a, for a human corpse uh, being dead for four days. I hope no one had a big breakfast because this might be a little graphic. Uh, mildly graphic, hopefully not. But we know that the human body has stages of decomposition. If you're, if you're a medical student or in that field, you probably know what I'm talking about here. There are stages of decomposition. Initial decay, that's the first part, right? This, is, this takes place between zero to three days. And in just in that time span, although the body may still appear fresh on the outside, the bacteria in the inside, specifically in the intestine and in the stomach, begin to die. To, to work its way out and digest the internal organs, eventually breaking down the, intestine, the intestines and the, the stomach and, and starts to affect the surrounding organs. The body begins to digest itself with its digestive enzymes and, and spread, it spreads throughout the body. Now, in addition to that, within that time frame, just from day of uh, death to three days, Insects are immediately attracted to the corpse, namely blowflies who, who lay their eggs in open wounds or orifices. And within 24 hours, maggots are, are crawling about and already eating away at the flesh. I see some creepy collie, you know, people are like, ugh. Then the next stage of that is putrefaction, right? Between four to 10 days. This is about the time that we see Lazarus around here. And so, uh, during that time, the, the bacteria that has been breaking down the flesh releases foul-smelling odor, gas, and fluids. And this body, this corpse, actually becomes bloated. And, and rather than, rather than uh, deflated, the, the gas and the, and the bile bloats the flesh and, the ins and attracts more insects because of the smell. And then the maggots who have burrowed through the corpse have become or matured to adult flies and they lay more eggs and of course more maggots and that attracts more predatory creatures and, and the open wounds are now just gaping cat uh, crevices in this human cadaver and by this time it is a mess. Absolutely a mess. Leaving nothing more than a, a rotten, bloated, odorous, insect infested cadaver. Corpse. That, again, is the state that Lazarus is in when Jesus arrives. And again, as I mentioned, because embalming wasn't a, a practice in ancient Israel, the, the, the practice of delaying decomposition, we can conclude that this is how Lazarus was in this tomb. And Martha's comments, Martha's concern about the smell was warranted. Lord, he's been dead for four days. He's going to stink. But again, this is the context that Lazarus' resurrection comes in. Where the previous resurrections happened moments after the, the, the demise, this was four days of rigor mortis, of decay, of rot. There is no denying that Lazarus was dead. Yet at the Savior's word, bile and bacteria was banished. Wounds and gaping flesh were sealed and restored Corpse-eating maggots and insects were expelled. Lingering sickness was exercised. At the Savior's word, lungs began to breathe. A heart began to beat. Blood began to pump. 
the synapses of the brain begin to fire once more as joints and muscle fiber and marrow and fingers and toes begin to move and twitch. And as breath filled the lungs of Lazarus and his eyes flutter and his soul comes back from shale at the Savior's command to come out, we see Lazarus come out of the grave. Creation obeying its creator, death subjugated by life and the glory of the Son of God displayed. That's what's happening in our text. Don't read past that. The thing that, as I describe the, 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 the decaying process of the human body, the thing that we would normally think we, no one could ever come back from, Lazarus comes back whole free of whatever sickness that killed him, free of any effects or any, any form of decay. Notice as well, this is maybe just a, a, a fact that we often overlook. The dead don't hear, right? A corpse cannot hear the command. Or if you tell a dead body to do something, it's not going to hear you. The idea here is that Christ's word, Christ's command transcends the material world and goes beyond to the spiritual. Remember why Jesus delayed, why he took two extra days before he came to this funeral. It says in John chapter 11, verse 4, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Notice again, even in Christ's prayer, that it's not a petition to bring Lazarus back from the dead. He didn't ask the Father to bring Lazarus back from the dead. He didn't ask the Father to give him the power to bring Lazarus back from the dead. He simply thanked God for hearing him. And that was for the purpose of those around him. The point is, Jesus was not a man that was granted the power to, from God, from the Father, to raise the dead. He was equal to God in power, in nature, and in authority. As John states from the beginning, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. The source of life itself is found in Christ. As Paul states in Colossians, all things hold together in him. By bringing the rotten corpse of Lazarus back from the dead, he was demonstrating, in fact, that he was the resurrection and the life. The author of life, in whom all, is, all life is held together and in whom death flees. And you know, I was going to save this for the end of our, of our sermon as we close off, but listen, if Christ could do that to death, the number one, the greatest enemy of humanity, how much more the other things that we struggle or wrestle with? How much more depression? How much more sickness? How much more broken relationships? How much more our struggles with sin? If God can restore a decayed corpse to life, how much more the rotten hearts of humanity, our corrupt minds. And after this miracle, there's no denying it. Jesus had explicitly and undeniably declared to Mary and Martha, the disciples, and everyone at that funeral that he was, in fact, God. Because only God could do this work. Only God could do this. The resurrection of Lazarus unequivocally authenticates Christ's divinity. Now remember, in addition to revealing his glory and his divinity, this miracle also serves to bolster the faith of his disciples. In John chapter 11, verse 14 to 15, uh, again, when, when, when Jesus is talking to his disciples about Lazarus' death, he says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad that I, am not, I was not there so that you may believe. He's talking to his disciples. Then in our passage, when he talks to Mary, when Mar Mar or rather to Martha, when Martha opposes the idea of rolling away the stone from the tomb, Jesus says, did I, not, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus, this great miracle of bringing Lazarus back from the dead is also to affirm the faith of his followers. The, significant, the second significance of Lazarus' death is to affirm faith. It affirms faith. Now, recall, in addition to the disciples and Martha, recall 
Recall to whom Christ was demonstrating his power over death and life, his resurrection too. Recall to mind Mary in this whole context. Remember how in this chapter starts with John chapter 11, verse 1 to 2. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with an ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. John puts emphasis on Lazarus' family, but in particular puts emphasis on Mary. Because chapter 11 it also serves to set up what happens in chapter 12, where Mary anoints Jesus. That's what John is talking about there in that, that second verse. Recall to mind Mary's faith from last week, what we discussed. Jesus arrives late. Lazarus is already dead. Martha comes, but Mary stays in the home. Martha has to go back to get her sister. Says the master wants to speak with you. Mary comes, falls at Jesus' feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Unlike Martha, who said exactly the same words, there was, there, there's no sense of hope in Mary's words. There's even a sense of blame. It's your fault that my brother's dead because you were not here, Lord. And then we see, as we talked about last week, that Christ weeps with Mary. Christ mourns with Mary. But he also, and specifically, he mourns over her unbelief. Her unbelief. So we see in our passage, as Lazarus is brought back to life, several kinds of faiths, several, several kinds of beliefs here. There's this, the disciples and Martha, those who believed in Christ but didn't know the extent of his power. He also had these unbelieving Jews that were at the funeral who questioned Christ and who, again, even the disciples feared that would stone Christ if they were to come to this event. And, of course, Mary, who once sat at Jesus' feet, now wavering, now doubtful in her time of trial, in her, in her sorrow. Lazarus' resurrection is a sign to all, everyone who was present there that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was, in fact, the resurrection and the life. And this miracle, this sign, was to affirm the faith of both the faithful and the unfaithful, both the believer and the unbeliever. It was a sign for the doubting and the discouraged. Here's the takeaway for us in all of this. Listen, our faith is not blind our faith is not blind. Oftentimes when you think, we think about the passage in Scripture, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. And we equate that to blind faith. Or that God demands from us blind obedience to trust Him without any evidence that He is faithful and good, and, and etc. That's not the case. The Bible is full of stories of God giving substance to the faith of believers. Something to base and, and something to anchor their faith to in times of trouble and trial. Abraham, in his old age, is promised by God himself that he would still have a son. Recall to mind Moses at the burning bush, who was too fearful and too insecure to confront Pharaoh, yet God shows Moses at the bush what he would do. The power, the glory that he would display in Egypt. Recall to mind Gideon and the test of the fleece. <laughs> he tests God twice. Recall to mind Elijah when he's driven into the wilderness by the evil queen Jezebel and he thinks he's the only one left in all of Israel worshiping God. And then he is spurred on by a small, still voice, recalling to mind that there is a remnant left in Israel. These are instances where God shows up and gives a sign in order to bolster the faith of his followers, of believers. In their times of trials, in their times of doubt and fear, insecurities, these are times where God shows up and gives them something to base their faith on. In fact, that's what the Bible is, right? A record of stories, of history, of God's faithfulness that we today, as we read it, can base our faith in, anchor our hope in. See, here's the whole point in this, right? God knows our fickle heart. 
God knows how prone we are to wander, to stray, to doubt, to fear, to be anxious. When we don't see results, when all we see is the next step in front of us and not the destination. God knows that without His help, we would all be like Mary in our hardships. Doubtful. Even questioning God, even blaming God for our circumstances. But just like in our passage with Mary... God will often do things in our lives to bolster our faith, our confidence, our trust in Him. It may not be the solution to our trials, escape from our problems, but it's grace in the midst of it. It's answered prayers. It's unexpected blessings. It's demonstrations of His faithfulness, encouragement from brothers and sisters. It's preservation through Through trials, protection from physical harm, healing from sickness. I'm sure all of us here can look back at some point in our lives where God has showed up. A memory that we cling to, that that bolsters our faith in times of trouble. An experience in life where, where, where God demonstrated His grace, His power, His love for us. And as a result, your faith is where it is now. Your faith is, is on sure foundation. It's stronger for it. The point is, God works in our lives so that our faith is not blind. So that when we face insurmountable odds, we can look back and see God's faithfulness, God's power, His grace, His preservation, His provision in the past, and know that as we head to the future, He will do the same. He will be faithful as well. He will be present in our trials, in our future circumstances. This is what's happening in our passage. Out of his love for Mary, for Martha, the disciples, those who would believe in him, Jesus acts to anchor their faith on something, to give them something to stand on, a substance to cling to, an anchor to hold on to. And our joy this day, in our present day, is that he does so for us as well. God gives substance to our faith so that we can trust more, so that we can cling closer to Him, so that we can know that He is faithful today, tomorrow, just as He was yesterday. Lastly here, significance of, last significance of uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. Everything that we talked about from the deteriorating corpse of of Lazarus in the tomb and and Christ's power, it alludes to salvation. It alludes to salvation. Paul magnificently writes in Ephesians Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, he says, and you were dead. You were, that's me and you. That's brother and sister to your left and right. Dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Dead. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, Even when we were dead, there it is again, in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Like Lazarus, we were dead. A corpse, beyond repair, beyond restoration, a cadaver, wrapped in the filthy rags of our death, unable to rise ourselves. Unable to move, unable to think, unable to hear even, as we talked about. This is in relation to the total depravity of man. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands God, no one seeks God. No one turns to God. We are, in fact, unable to, because dead people cannot. The Bible is very clear. But like Lazarus, we were loved by Christ called by name, given new life, 
and stripped of all filthy rags of sin. And to be clear, as Paul writes in that Ephesians passage, it's not by our performance, it's not by our, uh, our, our decision or doing good works or church attendance, it's by grace you have been saved through faith. We are brought from death to life. Resurrection, this resurrection of Lazarus, by the way, is a great illustration of the effectual call of God. The effectual call of God, meaning that the call, uh, the gospel call is both general, meaning it's preached to all, heard by all, but it's also particular, meaning that it's efficacious to save some, namely the elect. The resurrection of Lazarus is a great illustration of this effectual call. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came walking out. There's no choice by Lazarus. There is no, there is no, well, maybe I'll stay in here just a couple more minutes, God. Maybe, you know, get my sleep hours in. Not at all. When Christ called, Lazarus came. That's the idea. Romans, Paul talks about this in Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 31. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the effectual call of God, similar to Lazarus. He, when we are called by God to be saved to him, we answer the call. Those who, who God foreknew, again, that word foreknew is different from foreknowledge. It implies a relationship, it implies a love relationship. Those whom God foreloved, whom he loved before the foundations of the world, he predestined to be like Christ. And those he predestined, he called, justified, and glorifies. Those who he calls must answer that call, will answer that call. Paul also says in Romans chapter 11, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He's not talking about your your gift to play guitar or piano, your gift for connections. He's talking about the gift of salvation in that context. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That That is the salvific call of God. Those whom Christ calls out of the grave from the deadness of their sin will answer the call, will rise to new life, are justified, made righteous in the eyes of God, and are glorified. The resurrection of Lazarus illustrates, it alludes to how God saves sinners, how he has saved us. Just as we close here, again, great significances of Lazarus' resurrection, what it tells us about Christ and His plans, his purposes, again, it it authenticates Christ's divinity. His power over death. His power over over restoring that which decay and rot has, has already affected. If God can restore rot and flesh, again, how, how much more can he restore broken relationships? How much more can he restore illnesses, renew minds? Replace hearts of stones with hearts of flesh. How much more can you relieve anxiety and fear and insecurities? All, everything else beneath death, everything else that we struggle with as human beings. That is the kind of Savior that we have. And as we talked about last week, we don't have a high priest that cannot sympathize with us, but in fact can because he went through it all, as Hebrews talks about can sympathize with our fears and anxieties and our worries. The difference is that it will, it will not just a difference, but a great, our great hope is that we can depend on Christ. Because as he sympathizes with us, we also know that he has the power to save us. 
the power to renew us, the power to heal us. In addition, Lazarus' resurrection affirms faith. It demonstrates that God affirms faith. That in our weaknesses, in our doubts, God works to encourage, to bolster our faith, to give us an anchor to, to, to cling to in the, the, the waves and the winds of this life. And again, the resurrection of Lazarus alludes to salvation, our salvation. The effectual call of God to bring dead men to life at his word, his command. For the lost, this is the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That God is calling you out of the grave. If you have yet to put your faith in our Savior, in what Jesus has done on the cross, in what his death paid for, in, in, his, in, in his resurrection that assures us that the payment was complete, if you have yet to put your faith in Jesus Christ for your eternal security, I invite you to do so today. The call has been made. The call to put your faith in Christ, to repent of your ways, of your sin, and turn to him. The invitation is there for the found. First and foremost, I I pray that we would have this awe and wonder once again of this great miracle that, that God has done, not just in our text, not just in Lazarus's life, but in ours. Because again, we are that dead man. We are that rotten, we were that rotten corpse that Christ called to new life. And though we may not have experienced or witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, we know today and we experience today the new life that we have in Christ. And I pray that that would come through, uh, come out as a wellspring of joy and praise a wellspring of joy and praise for the grace that we have received in our life. But at the same time, it ought to be an encouragement that we should no longer live for ourselves. That the old self has died, been crucified to the cross. We are to put on the new man, the new creation, citizens of heaven. I love, by the way, how our passage ends when Jesus says, or after, the dead, the, after Lazarus came out of the of the grave and still wrapped in his clothing, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Take off the the wrappings of his his death. Take off the wrappings of, of any evidence that he was dead at all. In the same way, that is a call for us believers. Take off the wrappings of our former sins, of our former life, our former deadness, to no longer be bound to sin, to shame, to guilt, everything that made us dead in the past. The call from Christ is to unbind him, let him go, to, never, to no longer live for ourselves, to no longer live for the passions of our former self, our former ignorance, but rather for him who died and was raised, so that we would live for him. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we marvel, we rejoice, O God, again, at this great miracle that you demonstrated. You demonstrate through your word and even in the context, God, in the life of of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, we now benefit from, O Lord. We are reminded, O God, of your power your power over death, our greatest enemy. We are reminded, O Lord, that just as you have subdued our greatest enemy, how much more the minor inconveniences, the minor afflictions that we have in this life. Our sicknesses, our depression, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, how much more they 
falter in the name of Jesus in the presence of the Savior. And Lord God, we are reminded that again that in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our trials, in our doubts, and in our fears, you are faithful. You are with us. You are a present help in our times of trouble. And you give us something to stand on. You answer our prayers. You bring healing. You give us evidence of your goodness and your love. You bring people to encourage us, to edify us. Because you are a good God and you love us. And though you, you do not need to, though, though, you, though we are so prone to wander and so prone to, to flee and doubt, God, you are still good and faithful to us. Still good and faithful to bring, in, to bring us through our trials and troubles. And Lord God, again, we are reminded that Lazarus is us, Lord. We were dead in our sins, the passions of our flesh, in the passions of our former ignorance. And God, you saved us. Not because we have done anything or do anything that would merit salvation, not because we, you, you found anything good in us, not because of our works or church attendance or our good intentions, but out of your great love, out of the abundance of your grace, out of your richness and mercy, you called us from the grave and gave us new life so that we may no longer live for ourselves, but live for him who died and rose from the grave, the Savior. And so, oh God, I pray that we would cling to this great hope, that our hearts would be struck with awe and wonder once more, that we would rejoice in the joy of our salvation, and that, God, we would live a life worthy of this new life that you've entrusted to us. We thank you, O oh God, for securing eternity for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Ask that you'd be glorified in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name.